Well, good morning, everybody. You are at Nonviolence Radio. I'm your host, Stephanie Van Hook, and I'm here in the studio with my co host and news anchor from the Nonviolence Report, Michael Negler. Michael and I are from the Meta Center for Nonviolence in Petaluma, California, and our work is to help people develop, sustain, and deepen their practice of nonviolence. And no matter what the odds, we are strong supporters of the fact that nonviolence works, and it's just for us to figure out how it does. On today's show, we're talking with a community leader from Petaluma, Natasha Juliana. Now, she is working with a team of people to take a creative approach to the challenge of climate disruption, and one that doesn't look like what other solutions look like right now. I mean, this is a all-hands-on-deck time for nonviolence and climate disruption, and Juliana and her team are looking at a human approach. Petaluma received a $1 million grant um, to do a pilot project called the Cool Cities Challenge, and now this project is called Cool Petaluma. So we want to speak with Natasha Juliana about her role in all of this, how she got involved, and how you, our listeners, can get involved and uh, do something similar in your communities. Welcome to Nonviolence Radio, Natasha. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Michael. I'm so happy to be joining you this morning. <laughs> and, you know, Petaluma is a pretty cool city. That's my, my cousin uh, <laughs> used to, you know, live up in Portland and he, you know, we're making shirts for the Meta Center. And he said, you know, put Petaluma on your shirt. Like, <laughs> it's a cool city. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, but this is, and, and I've told him about the work that's happening with the Cool Cities um, initiative that you helped bring to the city of Petaluma. So let's start a little bit with just sort of an overview of what is the Cool Cities Challenge and what is making Petaluma cool. That's a fantastic question. And yes, I agree, Petaluma is a cool city just to begin with. Now, (laughs) Now we have more reasons to live up to that. So the Cool City Challenge was put out last summer and it was an invitation to submit an application for this $1 million grant, which would go to three cities of California, if you could show that you had ample community involvement to achieve major collective action around climate change. The interesting thing about this program, which really drew me to it, was it really focused on involving the community in a way that gave everybody agency and really talked about improving quality of life because so often, you know, our talk about climate change seems so overwhelming and, and large scale and hard to, um, to have any, you know, way that we as individuals can make a difference in a a meaningful way. So this just helps prove that what we're trying to prove here is that this collective individual actions can really make a huge difference. And so we gathered a team of Petaluma residents and put together a winning proposal. And it's now Petaluma, Irvine, and L.A. that um, are in this challenge together. And the collaboration with those cities has been very exciting as well. Yeah, we first heard about this through our friend Derek uh, Douglas Hecker, who helped me create a board game for the Meta Center, who has been very enthusiastic about the project and um, is, I believe, is going to be one of your block leaders. He is, yes. (laughs) I know Derek well, yeah. Yeah, and what's been great is that it just, um, so the way this program works is it focuses on, on finding what they call cool block leaders. And in order to apply for the program, you had to find 200 people to volunteer to be block leaders Mm. who would lead their their neighbors on this four and a half month journey through five different categories. And we ended up actually with 300 blocks, uh, far surpassing all of the other cities, even gigantic LA. And it just is a testament to the community spirit we have here in cool Petaluma and the timeliness of the program. And when you look at 
how widespread the in community engagement has been already just in the last couple months, you know, it's just really uh, it, very exciting and very hopeful. And so those block leaders are going to be the key to our success because they help spread the word and work in collaboration with their neighbors, which I think mm-hmm. is so important in this day and age to kind of reconnect with each other. Yeah, as, as we were saying before this interview, that the pandemic has really brought a sense of both interconnectedness and isolation and people want to reach out and they they're also concerned about you know what has gotten us into these Mm -hmm. dire situations that we're in on a number of levels so this is it's a very empowering project but let's let's back it up a minute and and talk about the theory of change that is a part of the of the cool cities challenge initiative um because i have to say when i when I first heard about it, I felt a little bit skeptical, and I imagine you did too, as somebody who's been involved in climate um, initiatives for some time, is what I understand, is that how can we be hopeful about individual actions, um, you know, changing our light bulbs or reducing, you know, the amount of water that we use as individuals when some of the, the biggest polluters, the biggest causes are, you know, um, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of agriculture and, you know, corporations. And I feel like there's sometimes is an unnecessary burden put on individuals to, you know, change their light bulbs and take on guilt for, um, but not address that, you know, corporations need to change or governments need to change the way they're doing things. But I learned a little bit more, and I hope you can talk about it, about how the individual and the collective action meet in this project. Great question. Yes, yes. So the the great thing about this project is it's taking both this bottom up approach and helping us look at the top down approach, which doesn't get as much press right now because it's a little harder to explain. But what we see and what I was so excited about, because I've always believed that, you know, that individual action is the on ramp to larger collective action and participation. It's, it's the way that we get introduced to a new way of thinking and ideas. And I know that there is some talk in, in neuroscience now about the idea that beliefs don't change actions, actions change beliefs. And so this is the way to get people starting to do something that then will change the, the way they see the world around them and the way they interact with the world, and the way they interact with their neighbors and the way... Uh, they see nature and their their place in, on the planet. And so this individual action is really just the on-ramp for, for getting people involved and conscious of this greater effort. And then we also have what are called the moonshot design teams. So really thinking about moonshot thinking, the incremental thinking that we've been doing is just not enough at this point in time to move the needle the way we need to move it now at the speed. So what we're looking at is creating these moonshot teams, which are made up of community members. We have so many great minds here and putting them together so that we can start thinking about also the bigger policy issues, the bigger financing issues, the equity issues, and looking at those through the the lens of, of the people who live here so that we can start to have more of an influence on some of those bigger issues as well. When you start at home, it's just so much more tangible. It's it's something that you can relate to, uh, you can wrap your head around it, and it really can focus on just improving your own quality of life. Like you were saying, you know, not putting this as a burden on people, but actually helping to improve your daily quality of life mm. so that this is actually – this journey becomes a joy. It's a benefit. It's not It's not a hardship. It becomes a benefit. Mm. And then I, I think the way that you put that is, is, is very clear. And I love that you're drawing from neuroscience that actions change beliefs, not beliefs changing actions. Um, very, very interesting. Uh, and, and I think also as, say, I'm, I'm on a block where there's a block leader and um, I'm working for city council right so i'm participating Mm -hmm. in that and then you know it's it will help me as i am helping to make you know democratic decisions 
in the in the community, right? So where I go with my individual action into my work, into my active mm-hmm. my other activisms is going to is going to be influenced by these block gatherings. Yes, and and then you also will have the support of the community to make bigger, bolder changes. Mm-hmm. You know, if if you know, uh, I'm sure you know that Petaluma was the first city in the U.S. to ban the construction of new gas stations, and that was in large part because of our city council, um, including my co-lead on this project, Delinda Fisher, Mm -hmm. and also because the community community really got behind it and supported it. And those decisions at a city council level can't be made if the community isn't supporting it as well. Mm. And and we find that, as as we said at the beginning of the show, with our work in nonviolence, that it's really hard to maintain a commitment to nonviolence when there's not support that out there you know that Mm -hmm. uh, wherever where you go people say you know nonviolence doesn't work you know but we with the clear understanding as well that violence isn't making anything better either (laughs) and yeah it it seems that these the times that we're in that these challenges that we're facing are requiring us to come together and build community and come and, and recognize our interconnectedness recognize our need for one another that we can't we can't go at these big problems alone. We need community support, uh, and we need mm-hmm. to, to do things together as a community. Yes, and that brings up um, a really great point in this project, which is that the blocks, when they start their, their journey together, the first actions that they take are around emergency preparedness. Mm. Because as we look, move into this climate disruption, we are going to see more, as we have already over the last four or five years, more fires, more floods, you know, depending on where you are in the, in the country, all kinds of, of reasons that it's helpful to be prepared mm-hmm. and why it's so helpful to have those relationships with your neighbors so that you can take care of each other. You can know who to look out for on the block and how to share resources. And that's just such an easy inroad for people. It's um, it's you know not political. It's mm-hmm. everybody understands it. Everybody's been experiencing it, so it's just a really great place to start. I, I like the way that you say that too. It's it's not political because this project isn't for people who just you know are progressive voters, right? This is people who are, are suffering from mm-hmm. the effects of climate disruption, which is all of us. Yes, and the program makes it very clear that you are not to intentionally leave anyone out when you go to knock on your neighbor's doors to invite them to the first introductory meeting you're you're to knock on every door no no matter the political sign or the you know past relationships Mm -hmm. that everyone is included invited who chooses to show up you know is is their own choice but but the fact that we're trying to be as inclusive as possible and bring people back together onto some common ground Mm. Michael has a question for you, Natasha. You, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> Hello, Natasha. This is there Michael. There you are, Michael. Hi. Gosh, I really love everything that I've been hearing. And uh, for some reason, as you were talking, two anecdotes about Gandhi came up in my mind that, that fit our situation in various ways. And by the way, I, I hope Stephanie mentioned our office is in Petaluma, so we are very much engaged here. Yeah. But One is a story about a woman who came to Gandhiji with her little boy and said to Gandhi, would you please tell this boy to stop eating sugar? And and Gandhi (laughs) said, okay, come back in a week. So she was a little bit startled by that, but she did what he said. Went away, came back a week later, and then he turned to the boy and said, stop eating sugar. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the boy said, yes, Bapu, <laughs> which is what they called him. So she was very grateful on the one hand, but on the other hand, very curious and said, you know, why did you have to wait a week to tell him that simple message? And he said, a week ago, I was still eating sugar. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Isn't that it? Yeah. <laughs> 
yes. So, so that's why we have to really build it up from the individual level on out, as you were saying. And that, that was, brings me to the other Gandhian image. He called it the oceanic circle. He says the individual serves the family, the family serves the neighborhood, the neighborhood serves the village, the village serves the state, the state serves the nation, the nation serves the world. Mm -hmm. However, uh, in, the, in our country, we've had this serious gaps in those expanding circles. You know, people relate to those immediately around them, and the next thing that they relate to is this huge, vast entity called the United States of America. And a lot of those uh, intervening circles that in allow that energy and that sense of unity to expand are not well developed here. So why am I telling you all this? <laughs> I'm telling you all this because it sounded to me like your, your way of doing this, your model, is a way of solving that problem, that it's individuals, neighborhoods, cities, and those cities are, are models for the rest of the state and so on and so forth. So, hooray. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> yes, hooray. I, I agree completely, and, mm -hmm. and that is exactly, I mean, you really said it well, and we're already looking at that. There is something very special about the size of Petaluma also that I think has made it easier for us to make quick progress. It's a big enough city that it, you know, we have the numbers, but it's small enough that we all know each other or know somebody that knows somebody. There's, there's a level of trust and community spirit already built in here. So it's been interesting. We've been talking already in conversation with some other cities in Sonoma County about like how can we help create a template that will work well for similar sized cities in, in Sonoma County because we, we're going to share certain things in common and really you know share all of this. And what I really love about this project is that I've always been – uh, interested in collaboration and cooperation, which is not the way of the, you know, capitalist <laughs> world. Um, and so this is just, it's so apparent that in this work we're doing now, we only win when everyone wins. Mm -hmm. If Petaluma gets to carbon neutral by 2030 and nobody else does, the Petaluma River, which is really a tidal slough, still rises and floods downtown. Like, the the imperative is to to collaborate in, you know s increase those circles and ripple out the way that you were just explaining mm -hmm. the best we can now i think that you I, you just said something that sort of shocked me and i and i hope i didn't miss it earlier in the interview but so it says your so your goal is of the whole project is to reach carbon neutrality in petaluma yes so the whole goal of this program, one of the requirements was to have had the city declare carbon neutrality by 2030 as a goal, which Petaluma did last January, mm -hmm. January of 2021. And so we were already qualified in that way. Of course, no one's ever done that before. So mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely a moonshot. But I have to say, putting a closer time frame on things actually seems to make it easier to focus because if it's too far out, we just keep kicking the can down the road. Yeah, I find you know, I work, we'll do that next year. I, feel, I find I work well under, you know, with a little bit of pressure, <laughs> some, a deadline. A little bit of a deadline. Yeah. yeah. Give me this yeah. report, Stephanie. Give me this tomorrow. <laughs> now, your emphasis on collaboration, it'd be nice to hear a little bit about you, Natasha Juliana. Uh, I know some about you from the community. I, I mean, before. Um, collaborative workspaces were really a thing. You were starting that in Petaluma with um, with Work Petaluma, and you've also been involved in uh, what, an Al Gore program for climate. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about, you know, your community activism uh, prior to this project? Sure, yeah. Um, I'll back up just a, a tiny bit and give you the, the very brief history of me. Um, I think a lot of my you know, how I see the world comes from my upbringing. So my family was part of the back to the land movement of the 1970s and moved up to Humboldt County to the middle of nowhere. So I, I grew up on this piece of 
land that was, you know, filled with redwood forests and blanketed by the Milky Way at night and just gave me a very different sense of my place in on the planet and in the universe. And also because that was a little bit of a counterculture that sort of rejected capitalism in a lot of way and, and, and sort of the standard um, uh, thinking on some things, <laughs> yeah, which I'm sure um, people around here can relate to as well. And so that sort of informed my, 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 my thinking in the world. My um, education's in architecture, and I worked in architecture for a long time, so I feel like that sort of design thinking brain is also really important in this day and age, just so that you can imagine things that have not yet been created and then figure out how to make them happen. And then I did, yes, I, I moved from architecture into uh, creating Work Petaluma, which was a co-working space mm. before co-working was really a thing. Mm. And then during that time, uh, was very interesting climate change, but realized I would go months without thinking about it. Mm. It was just sort of, nobody was really talking about it, so it was on the back burner. And then I watched The Inconvenient Truth, the, mm. the second one, uh, and saw that Al Gore had this program that I didn't even realize he, he did, which was the, um, the Climate Reality Project. And went to that, signed up that night, like at midnight. I just started filling out the application. I'm like, I must go. At the 11th and so hour. went to that. Well, yes, exactly. <laughs> and went to that three day training. I have to say, I was actually really impressed with that training. And Al Gore was actually there for all three days, really leading the discussion, not just as a figurehead, but very engaged in it. And Pete Gang was also there with me, who's also from Petaluma and part of our Climate Action Petaluma, very involved now. And that really kick-started my, my involvement in the, in the community mm. in a larger way and started hosting events at the workspace, climate-related events, movie nights, et cetera. And then that just kind of grew this community, which turned – we uh, was as part of the founding members of Climate Action Petaluma, which actually pushed for the climate emergency resolution – and the formation of the Climate Action Commission. And yes, it, it, it all kind of came together, that the fact that I was downtown with this community space where I got to meet a lot of people um, allowed me to have these connections into the community that I would not have otherwise had. It, now I look back on my life and it's like, oh, now it all makes sense, you know, <laughs> in, mm -hmm. in reverse, it makes sense how we've ended up here. Mm -hmm. And even that the pandemic even makes sense because I, I had to close my main downtown co-working space because collaborative workspace in a pandemic doesn't mm -hmm. work very well. So, but now I have the time and energy to put into this new project. So it all worked out. <laughs> it's just so wonderful when that happens. Uh, you know, we, we have a big project called the Third Harmony Project. There's a film, and the way that that film came together was just like that. Uh, and by the way, before we got our new office, we used to use co-work. <laughs> I know, so, I know you'd come into work, yeah. <laughs> That's right. So first, a comment and a question, Natasha. The comment is, congratulations on the name, Cool Petaluma. I'm a literary man, so puns <laughs> are just wonderful, and I, I really appreciate that one. But the, the question, which is maybe a little more serious, is you have stated specifically that what you're doing is a model and that mm -hmm. you want it to replicate. Has your team been doing any thinking about how to get it to replicate, how to move it into those larger circles? Yes. Um, well, first of all, the, the whole Cool City Challenge uh, larger entity that has issued these grants, it has been thinking about that. They started with just test blocks in a few cities in California, and now we are the test cities, and then their goal is to roll out in 2023 50 more cities, uh, half in California and half across the country. So they're already looking at that, but their scale is focused on larger cities, 60,000 and above, I think, or maybe it's 50,000 and above, So, uh, which is larger than a lot of the cities in the Sonoma County. So as a sort of personal goal for our team, we would love to, we are already starting to document everything we do and what works and what doesn't work and so that we can share that path with the other small cities 
in Sonoma County. Um, so if they want to follow along and, and try it out on their for their cities, they can do that as well and, and have not recreate the wheel every single time. So we have, you know, literal step by step for the actions that need to happen. That is a better answer than I'd even hoped for. That, that is so, <laughs> <laughs> so reassuring because that is exactly the way you do stuff like this. That's how you make things expand. Well, we only Great. have a little bit of time left with you, uh, Natasha Juliana from Cool Petaluma. The website is coolpetaluma.org, correct? Yes, so yes. So people can read directly about it. Um, and maybe a little bit of inspiration before we go. I'd, I'd love to ask you two questions. Um, what does nonviolence mean to you? And maybe what is, besides the Cool Cities Initiative, um, what is your what is the most creative action to uh, turn back climate disruption that you've seen recently? Well, for your first question about what is nonviolence for me, it really resonates me, with me with my view on the world here uh, with this project in that really trying to move us away from all of the war and sports metaphors that have typically been used when talking about climate change. So we have to hear a lot oh, of fighting yeah. and combating and defeating and, mm. and really challenging people whenever I hear that language used and trying to change the narrative to be one of growing and healing and enjoying this future. Um, because who are we fighting against? I mean, this is our planet. This is our, these, this is ourselves. Mm. We are nature you know, we are a part of this ecosystem. So I really want to see that um, that imagery change to, to be more positive. And, and, um, and then, oh, awesome. as far as, ex yeah. And then the second question was about, like, what's the most exciting thing that's, that I've seen? Yeah, if it might be in Petaluma. It might be something you've yeah. read that you're, because I'm sure you have your, your, your finger on the pulse of climate action and um, get looking for ideas, even if they're going on in the background of your mind. What's inspired you recently? I, you know, really, I could try to find some like technology fix or, you know, mm -hmm. th but those aren't the things that inspire me. What really inspires me is, um, gosh, a larger, bigger picture where, we, I feel like after talking to hundreds of people, I've just been able to talk to so many people about this now, and I really believe that we actually have all of the ingredients we need yeah. to, to make this positive transformation. We just need to get coordinated. It's like being in your kitchen and not knowing what to cook for dinner, and you just need to be creative about looking on your shelves and through your pantry and, and pulling the right things out and mixing them together and, you know, asking the neighbor for the, the extra bit that you don't have. And, and so I really have just seen such tremendous resources out there, yeah. um, both, uh, you know, from, from all angles. And I, I feel like we, it's just a matter of coordination and imagination at this point. Natasha Juliana is the Cool Petaluma campaign director. Thank you so much for joining us on Nonviolence Radio today, Natasha. It was my pleasure. So nice to talk to you, you Stephanie, and you, Michael, too. We were just speaking with Natasha Juliana from the Cool Cities Challenge or Cool Petaluma. You can find that information at coolpetaluma.org for how it's happening in our local community. And now we're going to turn to the nonviolence report with my co-host and news anchor Michael Nagler. Michael, welcome. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, and so what's happening in besides the Cool Cities Challenge in <laughs> Petaluma, which is pretty inspiring? Um, 
You've been thinking a lot about uh, Sudan because of our yeah. connections with um, a friend who was on the show a few weeks ago, uh, Mubarak El Amin. Um, and I, I'd like to hear about your analysis of nonviolence today. What's what's going on for you, Michael? Right. Uh, well, if I were to cite, you know, a kind of a keynote, a kind of central theme of what I'm seeing as I look over the world and all the nonviolent uh, episodes taking place in it. What I'm seeing is that, and this is around the world, that the use of nonviolence is becoming much more frequent and it's growing in sophistication and effectiveness and intensity. And I think one of the key new ingredients or newly developed ingredients that made this development possible is the commitment to learning. To, so that we don't reinvent the wheel, as you were just saying, every time there's a protest. And so we're not just reactive, but we're proactive uh, in, in getting society up on, the, on its feet. And so what I'm seeing now is that groups, uh, while there is a lot of protest going on, including Sudan, uh, there are, we're going far beyond protests. And there are over 300 methods of nonviolent struggle that have been documented among other places at the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict, I'm beginning to suspect that there really is no limit to the ways in which a person can practice nonviolence. So to look first at some of those learning resources, there's a, a new book from the Mumbai Sarvodaya Mandal, which means Mumbai used to be Bombay. <laughs> Uh, Sarvodaya was Gandhi's term for the uplift of all, and Mandal literally means circle. So this is an organization in India that you can easily look up. They have a book out uh, called Tagore and Gandhi. Now, Rabindranath Tagore was a major figure in the public consciousness of awakening India in Gandhi's time. And so Gandhi actually went and sought Tagore's blessing at every critical juncture of his public career when he was back in India. And Tagore, on the other hand, openly acknowledged Gandhi as the greatest Indian of his time. Of course, uh, Einstein, meanwhile, went a little bit further and uh, said that Gandhi was basically such an advanced human being that people would not be able to believe that he trod the earth in, in flesh and blood. In fact, <laughs> on the negative side, that's partly exactly what's happening. They can't believe that the person did that and accomplished that, and so they just turn away from it. So it's just what all this learning is trying to overcome. And I'm happy to say uh, my book is on sale right now at, at Barrett Kohler. For those of you who are interested, it's called The Third Harmony. And I'm very happy to say that metacenter.org is developing a beautiful new website. Mm -hmm. Stephanie is the one doing that. Yay. Yay, indeed. Can't wait to see this. This is going to be my biggest Christmas present. And uh, I frequently talked about the Swarthmore College Global Nonviolent Action Database, where they are tracking episodes of nonviolence, past, present. When I first heard about this, there were about 900 entries, 900 episodes that they tracked. Well, that number is up to 1,400, and it just seems to be growing every week as we find out more and more about this forgotten history. And I have to say that the, the GNAD, the Global Nonviolent Action database at swarthmore.edu is very well organized. Uh, I'd like to see them doing a little bit more with the distinction between constructive, proactive actions and resistance, but their job is not to please me. <laughs> it's to get this information out to everyone, and they're doing a wonderful job at that. Now, when I started the Peace and Conflict Studies program at Berkeley, it was one of the really new programs of that type in the country and the only one, I believe, that had a nonviolence course at its core. Uh, so now there are uh, 
programs coming on all the time. And the latest one that I noticed is a Master of Sustainable Peace Building. And that's at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. They are probably following this formula of peacekeeping, peacemaking, peace building, where uh, peacekeeping is where you just do intervention, get the two sides to stop fighting, stop shooting at each other. Peacemaking is where you actually get them to agree on the issues that were dividing them, and peace building is where you create the structures for a more enduring peace going forward. So however that may be, I'm not sure how specifically they're interpreting that term peace building, but masters in sustainable peace building, for those of you looking around to add a graduate program, graduate degree to your name, they're now accepting applications starting for fall 2020. Meanwhile, in India, of a similarly, the Sevagram Ashram Pratishtan. Let me say a little bit about that. Sevagram was the name of Gandhi's ashram that he started uh, in India. When he got back, it means the village of service. And Pratishtan means an organization, approximately. So the Sevagram Ashram Pratishtan is announcing a residential short-term course on Gandhian thought and action. This will be mainly for university students from different parts of India, though, of course, others can also apply. And the objective of the course, which is kind of a nonviolence training camp, is, I'm quoting from them now, to acquaint the students with the life and work of Mahatma Gandhi and its relevance in humanity's current predicament. Boy, if I were still a graduate student, I would hitch a ride over to India and take that course. Mm -hmm. So it will be held at Sevagram this month. It's coming up very quickly. And it will provide a unique opportunity for students to understand Gandhi's life, Mm -hmm. primarily through talks and discussions and noted scholars and so forth. Now, there's uh, a very timely article by Mike Lofgren, and it's called... Will the media wake up to the danger to American democracy? Well, some of the media does. Uh, I often see statement that our democracy is hanging by a thread, our democracy is in peril, and uh, those statements are all true, and they, they do seem to be working in the sense that they're galvanizing some people to take action. But I want to talk about just one phrase that Lofgren uses. uh, And it's a sentence, really. Asymmetric polarization, unquote, is a poor way to describe what he calls literally a descent into madness. Well, I (laughs) sincerely hope things won't descend much further in that direction. But this certainly is a wake-up call. And for us here at the Meta Center, that means... It's a a wake-up opportunity to get people more and more involved in nonviolence and to realize, as Gandhi said, that nonviolence is not the inanity it has been taken for down the ages. That is, people tend to think, and I'm talking now from my acquaintance with hundreds of students, and now the general public, of course, through META, People tend to think that nonviolence is a protest. That's all that there is to it. That's all that it means. And that really is making it into an inanity. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Nonviolence is a complete reframing of the image of the human being and the kind of world that we have the potential to build, the kind of thing that Natasha Juliana was just talking about. I want to do a bit of a shout-out to Jessica Reznicek, who has just been put in prison for uh, breaking into a drilling facility. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I want to highlight a statement that she made recently because it really does, kind of, it's kind of the irony of the week, and it really does say something about where our priorities have gone askew. So her statement is, I was indicted on malicious use of fire when the whole earth's burning. So this, this brings up a very serious question in nonviolence, which uh, has no easy answer. 
and that is the question of property destruction. Mm -hmm. It is really one of those gray areas. When is it, if ever, a nonviolent act to destroy something that doesn't belong to you? And uh, I don't know if putting it that way is really bringing, bringing this out, but I do believe that there are points there, stages in the development of a crisis where the nonviolent actor really has no other choice. And he, there's no other way that she or he can get the attention of the people who need to give it their attention and so forth. And it's similar then to a famous case, which also sounds very controversial at first, which is the, what I call the madman and the sword. Gandhi was challenged, mm -hmm. and he said, what would you do? Okay, you're nonviolent. The, the questioner thought that nonviolent meant pacifist, actionless, dead wrong. The, the question, what would you do if a madman were running through the village with a sword, creating mayhem? And Gandhi said, the person who dispatched that lunatic, which is a very strong language, the person who dispatched that lunatic would be doing himself and the village and the person a favor. Now, I thought a lot about this because, you know, it's really such an agonizing question. I, I want to be nonviolent, and here I am being called upon to take out a person who's raging around with, in, that, in his case, a sword. Uh, how do I do that and stay nonviolent? And I came up with this formula that the way to do it is on the negative side, not to triumph over your success, not to gloat. And on the positive side, to, again, take this as a wake-up call. How has our society gone so wrong that people are running around doing this kind of thing? And if we, if we do that without feeling anger or fear uh, to the extent that we can avoid that and we commit ourselves to solving the underlying problem, then I think we've done the best that we can, even from a nonviolent point of view. However... It's also important to note that in 50 years of Gandhi's active career, he was never in that kind of situation. So it's not that we're likely to face it in so many terms, so many words, but uh, the principle is useful. So I want to turn now, again, still talking about growing and learning. I want to talk about uh, a recent article in Common Dreams by a good friend, journalist Bob Kohler, and in his article he writes this, when we wage war, we dehumanize and then possibly kill a specific segment of humanity. Now, in the process, we fray our own humanity. As we wage war, we dehumanize the world in the process, shattering its complex interconnectedness this does not make us safer. And then he very importantly adds, this is not about blame, this is not about shame, this is about change. So I, I heartily endorse that statement. It's, it's the first start with the recognition that you cannot injure another human being without injuring yourself, and that when you prepare to do this on an enormous scale, which is what war is, then uh, you, you are actually not making yourself safer. And actually, of the 41 wars that the United States have been involved in since World War II, uh, none of them really succeeded. None, none of them was a win. Okay. Now, here's another opportunity coming up. Uh, it, it's called Joy in the Dark. Winter Solstice Nonviolence Retreat. And you can find it on the website of Pace Bene. That's P-A-C-E-E-B-E-N-E, -E -E -E, which, of course, was uh, St. Francis's way of greeting people. And incidentally, I tried it when I was in Assisi. I, whenever I passed a, a monk or a nun, I would say, 
pace bene, and they all say pace bene, so it definitely works. Now, we have a resource at the Meta Center called Nonviolence Daily, and yesterday there was a very significant uh, message in it. It was uh, something that I wrote uh, about an experience I'd had a while back. Here, here's what I said. An Army recruitment sign stands alongside a road in Petaluma, California. It depicts a young woman, probably a recent high school grad, with the words above her, quote, I'm Army, I'm tough, challenge me, unquote. So as we were coming back home from Meta recently, driving past this billboard on the way out of town, I, I thought, what would I say <laughs> to that young woman? I would say, you want to be challenged? Let's see you take up Jesus' challenge to return love for hatred. Mm -hmm. That would be the real toughness. And I thought of a uh, story about a Zen Buddhist abbot. And the monastery was attacked by, I don't know, samurai, some brigands, and they, you know, created all this mayhem, and they come up to the abbot who's sitting calmly in a meditative posture. One of the brigands threatens him with a sword, and the abbot doesn't even flinch. So the brigand is uh, aroused by this, and he says, according to this story, don't you know who I am? I could cut you in pieces without blinking an eye. And the abbot says, don't you know who I am? I could let you cut me in pieces without blinking an eye. Mm. Now, talk about Sudan. Of course, it is a kind of highlight in the history of nonviolent conflict that's going on right now. It's benefited from an enormous uh, turnout. But on the other hand, looking at it from my perspective, and of course, I'm not there. I don't know it intimately. But it looks like what they're mostly lacking is a list, a repertoire of different techniques that uh, I mentioned early on in my segment of the show. Because like every protest, it has to come to a conclusion. Either you dislodge the government that you want to get rid of, assuming that's what your protest is about, or your taxes, or whatever, uh, or if you don't, the time comes when you have to escalate. There are nonviolent escalations to different tactics. And I've been sending some of these suggestions out to our friend Mubarak El Amin. Another very interesting observation that we can make about the protest in Sudan is, uh, and here's a quote from Mubarak, one thing to highlight about this protest is the creativity of the different groups. Super important in nonviolence. Mm -hmm. So they launch white balloons with the names of martyrs of the revolution, white flags they wave that have uh, images of these martyrs, and then they have something called a daily revolution attendance book. They had people signing their names on a long white linen garment stretching along the street. And he says, using white linen is intentional. It is very symbolic. Red flag to me. <laughs> it is very symbolic. In our culture, white linen is used as a shroud. So to me, this illustrates both the potential and the difficulties of using symbolism as opposed to direct action in nonviolence. One is, uh, after all is said and done, a symbol is just a symbol. It can be ignored if the target audience or the reference public decide to ignore it. The worst part is that if you stop at symbolic action, you're sending a message that you don't have anything concrete to do. And that is really a very bad message you want to show. However, symbols, as we know, can galvanize actions, and they can reduce complexities to a very 
a stimulating and understandable simplicity. So it remains to be seen whether the activists in Sudan will go or perhaps are already going beyond that symbol into the critical dimension of constructive, proactive action. And then, if in the end, if this works out for the best, it will show that the joint arrangement that was made after the last revolution in Sudan, and there have been five of them, incidentally, since the 1960s, it will show that this joint arrangement between civilian government and military government was unrealistic. Military government will always assert itself against civilian rule. They don't trust it. They don't feel that it makes them secure. Okay, well, there is an atmosphere that's been created in Africa today which emboldens generals and military cliques to seize power, not just in Sudan. And interestingly enough, our friends at the Meta Peace Team, they're part of our favorite project of unarmed civilian peacekeeping, while they were at the U.S.-Mexico border recently, the team met with people from Cameroon, Cameroonians who were fleeing war and seeking legal asylum. They were angry because they found themselves being purposefully ignored. And so our, the friends from Meta Peace Team, they felt the frustration building up. So they went into that crowd to listen. As they vented their fear and concern, one woman ang angrily repeated her resentment over the injustice of it all. And slowly it registered on her and the others that they were being listened to, that we in Meta Peace Teams were sincerely listening to her. And that's the first step in de-escalating conflict, any kind of conflict. So then they began to talk, building on that step, they began to talk about what to do to change the situation. And they shared examples of the power of creative nonviolence. So this is a really hopeful kind of procedure that happened, a hopeful dynamic. We hope we see a lot more of it. Uh, their final statement is that we knew that our being there had made a difference. It was the power of compassionate nonviolence. So uh, there's more to say about unarmed civilian peacekeeping today. The Nonviolent Peace Force has recently sent out a mailer talking about their uh, work, and they say they have trained 81 students from Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger how to work toward a peaceful future in their communities by using nonviolence. Thanks so much for that nonviolence report, Michael Negler. The, uh, you know, this is our last nonviolence report of the year. Uh, we're closing in on the new year, 2022, uh, that's, which is pretty amazing. And, um, you know, I wonder if you have any, you know, end of year message for people. My message would be the when, you know, when you're looking for nonviolence news out there, people always ask, well, if you don't find it in the mainstream media, where do you find it? And I think that, like our guest Natasha Juliana shows with Cool Petaluma, we get nonviolence news by talking to our neighbors, by getting involved in organizations and seeing the things that people are doing that aren't getting the press that are contributing to positive social change. So that's where you get your news. You get your news from, you know, the, the listservs of organizations that you're a part of, that their only way of sharing their message is through, you know, their email list or through their Facebook. It's not getting into you know, big media, except, you know, shows like nonviolence radio. But <laughs> what message, what tip or, you know, what last year, end of year message do you Golly. have? Golly, I would just add one thing to that, Stephanie, and that is you have to know what you're looking for. Yeah. You have to sensitize yourself, which is, uh, of course, largely what Meta is all about. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> Hope to see you in a more nonviolent future. We want to thank our mother station, KWMR, and to Natasha Juliana for joining us today, and Brian Farrell, who puts it up at Waging Nonviolence for a larger syndication, Annie Hewitt, who also edits the transcript, makes it readable, 
There's so many people involved. You are listeners, uh, the Pacifica Network, who helps to syndicate the show, and everybody who supports community radio. Thank you very, very much. And Happy New Year.